And here it is! Move along, Viego, we got a more exciting story to talk about. Especially this time, we are dealing with a story that will make you go either nice or woo! Right, promised spice and spice we got. So today, we are finally going to have a look at the romantic story of Leona and Diana. Now, you may be wondering, romantic? Did the story ever have a part where the two could get together? Well, after the fourth or fifth change to the story, we got another tiny tweak. Which means that at some point in the future, I might end up covering their full story. Again. In the latest iteration, it was revealed that the two were both from the Rakor tribe studying the Solari faith in the same place. Long story short, Diana figured out that the Lunari faith is a thing, despite the Solari priests trying to hide it, she told her best friend Leona about it, but even she told Diana that it might be a good idea to just forget about it, because she might get punished. And so, because everyone around her refused to even talk about the potential forgotten faith, Diana went to the only place that could give her answers, the peak of Mount Targo. Of course, Leona cared about Diana, and even though she also thought that Diana was turning into a heretic, she still followed her to make sure she was safe. This is how both of them got to the peak of Mount Targon, and this is how both became aspects. But while Diana was open to the fact that the sun and the moon are destined to work together, Leona stayed loyal to the Solari faith, which resulted in a massive battle at the peak of Mount Targon. That's how the two got separated. If people are interested, we can make another video summarizing the full story of Leona and Diana after their sixth rework. But for now, that's all the info you'll need. So now, without further ado, let's have a look at the story called Rise With Me. Before we start, we have to mention two things here. First of all, this story is told through a series of Rakoran documents and personal letters. But also, each of these documents has a date on it which is in relation to either the zenith or the nadir. The zenith being the point at which the sun is at its highest possible peak, and the nadir being the point at which the sun is on the exact opposite side of Mount Targon at its furthest possible point. With that explained, let's begin. The first part is a poem that sets up the Solari faith. From this we learn that those who worship the sun believe that the sun is a tool of a god the Solari simply call her. And even though it is never hinted anywhere, it might be safe to assume that she is possibly her. The poem then goes on about how sad it is when the sun has to rest, and how they mourn her when she slumbers. The poem is called Hymn of the Dawn, and this part is taken from Tablet 16, lines 33 to 60, which suspiciously hints at the fact that there is a lot more to this. This part just happens to be the one talking about the sun. Then we get a missive from the high office of the condescent priestess Thalaya, forwarded toward the nadir. This is a message to all the students at the Temple of Auroral Triumph. With each day, the sun was traveling further and further from them, which made days shorter and the winter more dangerous. And yet, they were preparing for the festival of the Nightless Eve, which would come in 40 days. The message stated that some acolytes may have noticed that this year, the temple would be using a different holy lantern glass from all the other years, to light the first sunspark torch. Because last year, someone broke it. And so they were thankful to Sunforger Isur, who made them a new holy lantern glass. Also, those who were of age to receive their first shield were required to attend the Nightless Eve and show the sun their worthiness through dance and song. Should they want to, they were allowed to attend the festival in pairs with another acolyte. The message ends with the words, Only through our devotion may the darkness be kept at bay. Two days later, 38 toward the nadir, we get a letter from initiate priestess Elsine to an acolyte formerly in her care, with this acolyte being Diana herself. Priestess Elsine has heard that her former student was walking a dark path, voicing doubt in their teachings. In this letter, the priestess explained that it is good to ask questions, but it is unacceptable to suggest her instructors were wrong. She also added that it is true that her instructors were but mortal, just like all of them, and that none of them really fully understood her glory. But at the age of 14, her new instructor, Initiate Priestess Nasande, would not debate with Diana, and she would issue punishment. 
At the end of the letter, Priestess Asaine mentioned that it might be difficult to find friends while earning the wrath of her instructors. And she mentioned that if Diana swore to follow her advice, she would speak for her with the new instructors. In the light, signed, Initiate Priestess Elsine. The same day, 38 toward the Nadir, we got an entry from the Diary of Diana, Ward of the Rakor. Here Diana explained that apparently it was wrong to ask Nemia why they call night the darkness. After all, it wasn't completely dark at night. The light of the stars illuminated her path quite well. Diana wondered why they were to only speak of the sun and only see its light. What was the other celestial being? Of course, she would never ask this question in the oratory while Nemia was around. She realized it would be easier if she just quietly sat there, listening to the other acolytes spouting their pretty poems. Apparently, that day, they were supposed to discuss the upcoming festival. So, Sabina gave a little speech about how excited she was to celebrate her first nightless eve with the other shield aged. And that was it. That was all Sabina brought to the debate. It was just, won't this be fun? This is what Nemia had to work with, and she still decided to punish Diana. Here Diana also mentioned that Leona volunteered to get up and argue against it. But sadly, the only way to argue against I have an emotion was to bring up another emotion. One of exhaustion and trepidation about serving the sun the right way or something like that. Diana wouldn't call that oration, but she admitted at least Leona tried. Though, Leona also mentioned something about the darkness being somber. This made Diana pause. Not evil, but somber. Which wasn't the same thing at all. So Diana tried to speak after Leona, and she asked her question about the darkness. It was supposed to be rhetorical, but before she had a chance to continue, to talk about how the festival is just a way to reinforce how people already feel about celebrating the sun, how it is a ritual designed to subjugate them into orthodoxy instead of pursuing their own relationship with her. That was too much for Nemia. At the end of this entry, Diana wondered, just because she has blessed them with light and sight, doesn't mean the priesthood wants them to see things the way they really are. Diana couldn't be the first person to ever ask this question. Could she? More tomorrow. The stars have come out again, lit by that silverly glow. Signed. D. A day later, 37 toward the nadir, we got a letter from a devoted daughter. Of course, this is Leona talking to her parents. Here, Leona mentioned her two young siblings, Adonel and Caspina. She talked about how she's preparing for the Nightless Eve, and how she will celebrate it with the other Shield Aged. She was not yet decided whether she would like to attend the festival with another acolyte. So far, there were none that she would be interested in. Leona continued that this past week, she has done really well during the war games, and even their instructor, Initiate Priestess Nasande, praised her. After the war games, Leona asked Hyterope and Sabina to continue to train with her. Lastly, Leona mentioned that while her studying goes well, she is not good with her oration skills. She even mentioned this other girl in the oratory class, whose arguments are well constructed but her views and lines of thought do not always connect to what the instructors have taught. Yet she is always prepared, and the arguments of the other acolytes always fall apart. Leona wondered if she would be someone she could approach to get some assistance. In the love of her light, signed, Leona. Two days later, 35 toward the nadir, we get some notes passed between Leona, daughter of the Sunforgers, and Diana, ward of the Rakor. In the first note, Leona is asking Diana if she is busy after their middle Rakoric instruction. She sensed she wasn't doing well at the oratory, and so she humbly asked Diana to help her grow her skills. In the next note, she got a reply from Diana. Diana wondered why would she ask her for help. She was no longer invited to speak during the class, so why learn from someone whose arguments were deemed worthless by the instructors? Perhaps Sabina or the other girl she trained with would be a better help. They seem to be her loyal companions. Lastly, there is another note from Leona. Leona found Diana's arguments far ahead of anyone else in their year, and likely their temple. 
In fact, even after listening to the end-of-year debates and presentations from the other acolytes, Leona still felt like Diana was better than any of them. She knew Diana's time was limited. And so, in return, Leona pledged herself to help Diana back with anything she needed. The same day, 35 toward the nadir, we got a new entry in Diana's diary. Diana was shocked that Leona came to her. And in fact, Diana wasn't sure if this was some kind of a joke. But since she herself could also improve, she decided to help Leona. Obviously, they wouldn't be meeting in person. The instructors could see this as Leona siding with a heretic. And Diana wouldn't want anyone to laugh at Leona or mock her after she got so brave or humble enough to approach her. It was refreshing to see someone admit they are not the best at everything. And out of all people, Diana was surprised to see this from Leona. But that was probably because she had never seen Leona fail at anything. Besides, Diana liked the idea of talking to someone, even if it was someone fully blindly dedicated to the sun. Though if associating herself with Diana would lose her respect, what reasons would Leona have to keep talking to her? Signed, D. Two weeks later, 21 toward the nadir, there is a letter from a temple instructor to old friends. It was sun-sworn priest Polymenus, talking to Sunforger Isur, the man who created the new Holy Lantern Glass for the festival, but who was also revealed to be Leona's father. As his thanks, the priest sent Isur an invitation to join them at the festival, to see his creation light the sunspark torches. Later in the letter, the priest confirmed that Leona has risen to the top of all educational pursuits, and she even started helping the other acolytes with their vocabulary. After the latest war games, it was obvious Leona became a leader on the battlefields as well. However, the priest told Isur that after the games, when the other acolytes asked Leona if she would go with them to the festival of the Nightless Eve, she denied all of them and went off to study. The priest worried that Leona was overly focused on achievements, and she might miss opportunities to delight in the sun's gifts. It would be good if Isur could talk to her about it. In the light, Signed, Sunsworn Priest Polymnius. Four days later, 17 toward the nadir, there is an entry in Leona's journal. Here Leona wondered how to ask someone to attend the festival with her. A note seemed a bit too childish, though she loved getting notes from her. She always made time to answer, and was always very thoughtful and smart. Maybe she could ask her to take a walk together, but Leona had skirmishes every night. Flowers could work, but Leona wasn't sure if she liked flowers. A meal would be nice too, but she never shared a meal before. It was too public. Maybe she could offer to train with her shield. After all, she doesn't use her shield much. That could work. Though maybe she doesn't like using her shield. Or skirmishes. What about debating some texts? Trying to impress her. Maybe asking her to help with a big oratory project. But they were in the same class. That was stupid. Praying together? Good excuse for privacy, but she would never say yes. Or just asking if she already had plans. Being casual. But what if she's already going with someone? Who would go with? Tell her about not having a companion. That wouldn't be a horrible option. Not asking. Maybe she'll be there and she'll just be free for a dance. Also not a terrible option. Leona didn't expect this would be hard. Three days later, 14 toward the nadir, we have new notes passed between Leona and Diana. The first one is written by Diana, breaking down Leona's arguments. First of all, Diana was impressed by how well Leona's recent arguments connected. Even Sabina seemed to follow her logic. But then, Diana felt like Leona wasn't able to precisely tell what about the darkness was bad. Was it the absence of warmth? If so, was winter bad? Was cold water bad? Or was it the absence of life? Mount Targon itself is not alive. Is it bad? Leona needed either better examples or to change her metaphors. Also, she talked about heretics as people who didn't believe in the sun. But all people could clearly see the sun in the sky. Diana knew what Leona meant, but she felt like she could be more precise. Though Diana still pointed out that none of the priests had precise information. The teachings were still working off of theories more than facts. Lastly, Diana admitted her point about the everlasting day was good, as was her argument in favor of the shadow theory. But she didn't follow them through to strong conclusions. 
Diana finished this note with the words, but yes, you're definitely improving. Can you feel it when you are up there on the dais? Leona replied, yes, she definitely could. Here Leona thanked Diana for making time to reply to her again. She really appreciated her help and guidance. Without her, she wouldn't be improving so steadily. But she had further questions. Leona didn't believe that any of her conclusions were unique. More to that, none of the work Leona cited, being the hymn or other writings, ever attempted to answer the question, what is it about the darkness that is evil? The question was never why, it just is. So Leona wanted to know, why should she go deeper than what was widely known already? Also, Leona noticed that Diana wasn't practicing with her shield very often. So she asked Diana if she wanted to practice together, if she had time. ITL, signed Leona. Lastly, she got a reply from Diana. Right at the start of the note, Diana said that if these truths were so widely agreed upon, then surely it would be fine to dig deeper. They still didn't know who agreed on all of this, or when, or why. Still, originally, Leona asked Diana to help her structure her arguments better. So that's all Diana is doing here. She's trying to root the arguments in what they know, or at least what's considered canon. There are still forbidden tablets that could hold the answers to the rest, but since they are forbidden, they would never know. Regardless, Diana mentioned that Leona did a lot better last time around, and she was excited to see her next oration. She asked Leona to let her know if she would need help again, or if she would surprise her with the arguments. When it comes to the shield practice though, Diana didn't think she could ever successfully wield a shield, so she declined. But hey, as long as they were in the same team, she would know there would be at least one person defending her. Signed, Diana. Two days later, 12 toward the nadir, there is a short letter from sun-sworn priestess Nemia to her shining pupil Leona. The priestess congratulated Leona on her great debates, but she also apologized for the interruption during her oration. The priestesses were dealing with the issue. Leona didn't have to concern herself over it as she continued her path toward excellence. In her blessed warmth, signed, Sunsworn Priestess Nemia. On the same day, 12th toward the nadir, there is an entry in the disciplinary account, explaining what the interruption was about. Apparently, Acolyte Diana interrupted a fellow Acolyte's presentation, even after having been instructed weeks ago to remain silent during class. When she was told to stay quiet, she continued to flaw the other Acolyte's argument. Apparently, Diana suggested that the light does not belong entirely to the realm of the glorious sun. This may be relating to the fact that the moon is actually connected to the spirit realm. And in doing so, she poisoned the mind of every present shield-aged Acolyte. After talking to the condescent Priestess Talaya, it was decided that Diana would be punished by three days of standing in the light of the sun, without a shade or water, until the sun sleeps for the night, to remind her of the sun's merciful judgment. A day later, 11 toward the nadir, we have another entry in Diana's diary. Diana started by stating that the sun was not loving, life-giving mother of them all. She was hateful, burning with malice, and she aimed to drive them all underground to avoid her scorching light. Diana added she didn't really think that, but she also didn't feel like she loved her. The next day would be the third day of her punishment, and she was hoping for clouds, or rain, or snow. Anything, really. Her skin was red and raw and she wanted to sleep, but it was all worth it. During the debate with Leona, it was the closest she got to talking with Leona in public. She didn't even bring up the light that comes out in the darkness. She didn't have time before she was dragged off, and she wondered what would happen if she had. Diana added that she hated everyone there. She didn't want to celebrate anything. Instead of going to the nightless eve, she wanted to... climb. Just get somewhere higher than this place, and maybe watch the stars. Besides, the only person Diana would go with would never want to be seen with her. Not after this kind of public penance. Signed, D. After note, Diana didn't hate everyone. But not everyone was kind, and not everyone saw her as worth anything. She was sure Leona didn't see her as worth anything anymore. Four days later, seven toward the nadir, an entry in Leona's journal. 
Leona was mad because she had to pick someone to go to the festival with. Six different people asked her and she declined all of them. She didn't want people to think she was uptight. Sabina and Hyro believed that she already had a secret companion. Her parents would also be attending. And they wanted Leona to be more social. It was only a week away. And Leona knew about only one person who could go with her. But would going with Diana be a good idea? She just finished her penance and no one was being kind to her. Technically, Leona was the one who let her speak. She wanted to listen to her arguments. She was even ready to respond with some of her citations. But if they went together, would Leona be treated in the same way? Would that matter? Would it be worth it? Diana doesn't care about what others think about her. Why should Leona? According to Leona, Diana gets this look when she thinks she's right. When she's won her argument and the sun's light shines through her eyes and her smile. And she wears triumph like a crown and it is just magnificent. Well, Leona made up her mind. Two days later, five toward the nadir. Letter from condescent priestess Talaya to a disciplined acolyte's parents. Talaya informed the parents that Leona was involved in a fight with another acolyte. It didn't get physical, but neither of the girls revealed what they fought over there would be a measured penance for both of them. With her light cast over the world, signed, Condescent Priestess Talaya. The same day, we got a piece of an entry in Diana's diary. Diana was angry because the moment she told Leona that she wouldn't go to the Nightless Eve, Leona's eyes dimmed as if Diana told her that she was embracing the darkness. And then after everything Diana had gone through, Leona asked her, why not? That's when Diana realized that Leona was just trying to convert her. After all the notes, Diana didn't understand what gave Leona the idea that she would like to get preached at and turned into a full believer. Leona then told Diana that she asked her for help because she thought she could help Diana. So Diana got angry and yelled. She wasn't proud of it, but she couldn't help it. She was just glad she didn't cry. She should have known what all of this was. Luckily, Leona also got in trouble for this. But they wouldn't make her stand in the sun, so they were both assigned to scrub the floors all across the temple. The same day, there is an entry in Leona's journal. Leona knew she should have never asked Diana. Diana started yelling at her, publicly. They both got into trouble, and they would scrub the floors. Diana didn't care about celebrating the sun. She was practically a heretic. She probably wouldn't even dance if she did go. And now she would never write to her again. Leona should have just said yes to someone else. Three days later, two toward the nadir. Letter from disappointed parents to their daughter. The parents were disappointed by both her penance obligations and the fact that she did poorly at the last skirmishes. They knew Leona could do better and they were expecting her to rise again. They would be in the audience at the opening ceremony of the Nightless Eve and they would talk to her about how to better secure her future. In the love of her light, signed, Father. One day later, one toward the nadir. Diary of Diana. I'm beside myself with rage. She wasn't trying to preach to me. She was asking me to go with her to the festival. Ah, Diana, you are such a fool. One day later, the nadir. A missive from the high office of condescent priestess Talaya. To our shield aged and above, may you have a joyful festival at the nightless eve, and may you forever bask in her unending love and warmth. Our celebration begins at twilight. Be sure to dress appropriately in your formal temple garb. With her light cast over the world, condescent priestess Talaya. A day later, 174 toward the zenith. A letter from Leona, daughter of Sunforgers, to her parents. A letter which remained unsent. My day-blessed parents, glory to you both, in the light of the sun, and may the days grow long as we know her love once more. I missed the first half of the festival. There is also a part that is crossed out, where Leona started explaining why she didn't make it to the celebrations. The same day, Diary of Diana, Ward of Rakor. 174 toward the zenith. Diana couldn't believe she was writing these words with her fingers still trembling and have them to be the truth. It was unthinkable, unfathomable, and yet it happened. While everyone was getting ready for the nightless eve, 
putting on their armor. She didn't. Instead, she took her warmest robe and slipped out the back, out into the wilderness. She climbed up to a place that was carved into the mountain. It was a place that was supposed to feel closest to the sun. So she went up there, because it was a good place to sit and watch the sky. She witnessed the setting of the sun, the sky growing darker, and the sun spark torches burning bright. The horrible warmth still reminded her of her burns. And yet, when she looked up, even though she wasn't supposed to, the silverly light above her made her feel at peace. In that moment, she didn't worry about the instructors, the festival or what would happen when they realized she wasn't present. She felt calm. It was everything everyone said the sun should be. So Diana offered her a short prayer. Just a few simple words of thanks. That's when she heard Leona calling for her. Continuation of the letter where Leona explained to her parents why she missed the festival. A letter which remained unsent. Leona knew Diana wouldn't find the festival as exciting as the other acolytes. And so she pushed past her pain and upon reflection, she decided to find Diana and apologize. She knew where she wouldn't be, but didn't know where she would be. And so she searched for her first within the temple grounds. She had never seen Diana out at night before. She usually goes painfully pink if she's outside for too long. But there, cloaked in darkness, she looked like she belonged to the night. But not in a bad way. How could it be, when it is the same color as her hair, her eyes? Diana asked Leona why was she there. She was supposed to be at the festival. And as she spoke, she looked at Leona with something resembling fear or apprehension in her eyes. Disappointed, Leona remained silent. She could only gaze at her. Then Diana asked if she would bring her back to the festival. Leona shook her head and croaked an apology for making her upset and for getting them into trouble. Diana stared back at her and apologized for the same thing. Leona wanted to laugh, but things still felt too fragile for that. She didn't want to break the moment. It was, she realized, the first time she had spoken to Diana without anyone else around. Diana gestured for her to join in. So, she did. We sat together closer than we had ever been to one another before. Our arms brushed, and she flinched away like she's been burned. So you're not going to the festival at all? She asked. Maybe not exactly that, but something like that. I said something like, I don't know, it depends. My heart was beating hard in my throat as she leaned her head against my shoulder, but she didn't seem to notice. She looked up then, at the sky, and smiled. I don't think I've ever felt so happy before. I am not sending this letter. Continued Diary of Diana. We relaxed together under the light of the night for... hours? I lost track of time. I wanted so badly to point to the glow above us, to ask her what she thought, if that made her think about the sun and her light any differently. But instead, we sat beside one another and looking up together. At some point, there was a cloud that darkened the sky and I could see the light of the torches reflecting off of it. I still didn't want to go to the festival, but I know how important this sort of thing is to Leona, and she had stayed with me for ages without complaint. So I asked her if she wanted to dance with me down at the festival. I expected her to say no, but a smile broke across her face, bigger than I'd ever seen her smile before. I want to draw it, but I don't know if I could capture the brilliance. She grabbed my hand and said, and I will never forget this as long as I breathe. She said, not yet. And Leona kissed me. And I kissed Leona. The story ends with the continued hymn of the dawn. Tablet 7, broken and lost to the Solari. Lines unknown. Here it is revealed that the two simply want to share the sky. Since the sky was made big enough for two to dance. But instead, the two are forced into only stealing glances, before one dips down again. Yet here and there, a kiss. Love freely given, a gentle embrace. Moments of ecstasy and joy. Rise with me, she whispers. I will calm you with caresses, and let the world wait for the sun. Rise with me, she cries. I will warm you with my passion, and let the world be moonless tonight. And from their union we emerge made of twilight and dawn, encircled by their love. 
Well, this was the closest you will ever get me to reading a fanfiction. Although this one is canon. Everyone knows that if there is one thing I hate the most, it is changes to the stories. But goddamn, this was so well written. And it really gave this cinematic a new context. The entire point of this story was really to sprinkle some spice onto us. And I think Riot succeeded at that. Though, given the nature of this story, there is one thing I want to check out. With censorship being a thing, one may wonder, what does this story look like in countries that don't support Pride? Huh, that would have made my job easier. 